This is Thought in Motion, a series dedicated to the seminars of psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan. Today's video, the final one for this seminar, is part 3 covering lectures 13 to 24 from seminar 4. In the last two videos, we addressed the function of castration, the three registers of the father, and the role of the signifier in myth. All of this has been leading back to the case of little Hans and the specific structural dynamics involved in Bobius. And so today we'll cover the following. One, the role of metonymy and metaphor in phobia. Two, the difference between anxiety and fear. And three, Lacan's use of algebraic formulas to represent the emergence and resolution of phobia in the case of little Hans. The idea of associationism is that the mind operates by making connections among successive presentations of simple sensations and thoughts. These connections form ideas, and ideas come to associate with one another to form organized patterns of thinking. I mention this because the connective dimension of the signifiers is also based on these concrete associations, here named metonymy. Metonymy concerns how one signifier is referred to or yields to signifiers that are related to it in terms of their spatial or temporal proximity rather than their meaning. In other words, there is a concrete association that links them. Metaphor, in contrast, marks the substitute of one or more signifiers for another signifier, marking a transfer from the meanings attached to one signifier onto another, with sometimes several signifiers converging upon a single signifier, giving rise to what we called in Seminar 3, quilting points. Metonymy and metaphor are both relevant to the phobic object, which along with the fetish are structured by a metonymic logic whereby a signifier pertinent to the child's life gets displaced onto an item that is encountered through happenstance. And this initial metonymic displacement opens the possibility for the signifier of the horse to become a point of reference whereby the various sources of anxiety in Hans's life can become concentrated and contained through a metaphorical substitution, a function often performed by the paternal metaphor provided by the symbolic father. In this sense, and I'm a little hesitant to draw this conclusion, but I'll put it out there anyway, we might be able to say that the behaviorist understanding of phobia is actually much closer to the psychoanalytic one than it might first seem. However, rather than the phobia emerging through associations born of purely sensory qualities, the connection of the loud sound to the white rat, the associations here in psychoanalysis are linguistically mediated. Also, whereas the behaviorist remains at this quasi-metonymic level, psychoanalysis shows us how what is born of association can then function as a means for metaphorical substitution. In speaking of the famous case of Little Albert, provided by the behaviorist John Watson, a title, by the way, chosen so to mark a contrast in approach from that found in the case of Little Hans, thereby disputing the Freudian approach to phobias, it is not that the white rat was unconsciously chosen through a process of metaphorical substitution because something about the white rat meant something about little Albert's life, but rather that there was an initial contingent metonymic link that first gave rise to the appearance of the feared white rat and any meanings attributed to the white rat or for little Hans in the case of the horse are only later retroactively imputed upon these phobic objects through the signifier's function of metaphorical substitution. Having considered now how phobias are formulated through metonymy and go on to acquire meetings through metaphor, we now need to ask what function the phobia serves and what connection is there between this fear and the experience of anxiety. Lacan will spend a good deal more time developing the concept of anxiety in later seminars, but here he gives us enough for now to show its contrast with fear. Specifically, the difference between anxiety and phobia is quite literally that anxiety is without object. It entails losing one's bearings and questioning one's identity in confronting a fundamental absence that is found in every object 
and, in fact, in reality itself. In the case of Hans, Lacan states that his anxiety is about separation, a separation that leads him to confront the latent nothingness behind his imaginary constructions. Now, a separation from what? Well, from his mother, but this concern with separation from the mother emerges only upon Hans's real penis making its appearance for him. That is, when it becomes an object of satisfaction and pleasure, which he then exhibitionistically displays in the act of whittling. However, it is not the pleasure derived from whittling that is the source of his anxiety, but rather, in encountering the real organ, he also encounters a gap between what he has to give, what he has to offer the mother, and what the mother wants from him, what she loves in him, that is, the imaginary phallus. Now, on a side note, Lacan will later develop and reformulate the concept of anxiety, linking it to desire, and in particular the object cause of desire, objet petit a. But this description suffices for now to understand the function of the phobia. Now, ordinarily, the function of the father intervenes here to, in a sense, save the child from this anxiety through the act of symbolic castration, which delivers to the child a signifier that would then mediate the relationship between the child and mother, as well as be a source of substitute satisfaction. However, as mentioned already, this didn't happen right away for Hans. And here we have to add that the phobia that emerges as a replacement for the father's function also opened up by way of the mother's imaginary phallus, or rather the defense against realizing that in fact she lacks such a phallus. This becomes important because without the father's mediation, the child is confronted by not only the possibility of separation, but also of maternal castration. For if the mother is fully realized as the desiring agent herself for having been deprived the phallus, and that, in fact, Hans himself does not possess such a phallus adequate for the mother in realizing the real phallus, then he not only faces the possibility of separation in her abandoning him, but also her wrath for failing to satisfy her. This is what Lacan calls the mordaciousness or voraciousness of the mother. So there is a dual threat of separation and devoration. And these are the conditions that set the stage for the emergence of the phobic object, which fulfills a function against the backdrop of anxiety. The phobia aims at establishing a new order and structure to the world that allows one to contain the immense and pervasive anxiety that would come in confronting the nothingness and chaos behind such order. So the phobia is a defense against anxiety, but also delivers this anxiety a signifier that will allow the subject to speak it in some form. The way in which Lacan presents the structural transformations in the case of little Hans is through a series of algebraic formulas. Now, why does he present us with such highly abstract formulations? In part, it's because Lacan wishes for us not to get caught up in the imaginary understanding of the case. Also, there are limits in our ordinary use of language that requires producing new terms. So what he's after does not concern the particularities of little Hans's phobia, but instead how we might glean from this situation the generalizable structural dimensions at play. Analogously, we could examine the dimensions of a particular triangle all day, and perhaps that would yield something true about that particular triangle. But in deriving the Pythagorean theorem, we can now consider a principle that will apply to all sorts of right-angle triangles. Unlike a mathematical equation, the structural dimensions of human situations are much more fluid and the symbols produced are much more ambiguous. But it would seem that for Lacan, this possible limitation is far better and more useful than attempting to deploy concrete language and thereby come to a misleading sense of understanding anything about the case, let alone the function of phobias in general. Something like this seems to be meant in his deploying the term rubber sheet logic to describe this approach. In rubber sheet geometry, 
which is a branch of mathematics, a topologist, as they are called, seeks to twist, bend, and deform the surfaces of objects in order to determine what properties remain unchanged after making these transformations. So in what follows, I will do my best to unfold some of these formulas, describing what each is attempting to communicate and how they tie into the case of Little Hans. To begin, let us take up this formula here where we have represented the Oedipus complex in its so-called normal structure. The paternal metaphor, or the symbolic father, is marked by a capital P. It is placed over the X, which marks the child in its particular situation. So whenever one term is placed over another like this, the top term is thought to override or dominate the bottom term, so to speak. Here the whole equation is in relation to the mother, capital M. So the left half here can be read as follows. The child in its particular situation has access to the mother only by going through the father. The left half of this equation is brought into relation with the right half using the tilde which I believe here indicates something like being similar to or of the same order of magnitude as. The right side of the equation then begins with the crescent C or sickle representing the castration complex. The sickle is a tool belonging to the god Cronus, who was given it by his mother Gaia in order to castrate his father Uranus. It is the same character depicted on the book cover of both the French and English editions. But in this image, he is eating his son, who was prophesied to usurp him, which perhaps also connects to the mordaciousness of the mother. Added to this term for castration is S, standing for signification. So how I read this entire formula representing the Oedipus complex is as follows. The child's problematic relation to the mother, being mediated by the symbolic father, is roughly equivalent to passing through castration and in such a manner that the child can acquire new meanings for its desire through metaphorical substitutions. We should keep this formula in mind when examining the formulas applied to the case of little Hans, which deviates from this typical representation of the Oedipus complex, and we'll have to see why that is the case. In the second formula, we have the situation that little Hans is caught up in prior to the onset of the phobia. Here we have the mother, capital M, joined with the mother's imaginary phallic function, represented by the Greek letter psi, and the imaginary relation with his little sister, Hana, represented by the Greek letter alpha. I believe these three terms are equated with the X in the previous formula, thereby representing the particular situation that Hans finds himself in. Since we already have an imaginary representation of the mother in her phallic function, and later we'll have another representation pertaining to the function of the real mother, I believe this M is to stand for the symbolic mother, though I didn't see that made explicit anywhere in the text. What is needed in figure 2 is the function of the symbolic father that can restructure the situation in a manner that, through castration, allows for new significations. However, there is no mediation that would allow Hans to metaphorize his situation so as to escape it and transform it. For this reason, Hans has to introduce an element to function in the role of the absent father, which is the horse, symbolized by the capital Greek letter iota, but with the diacritical mark given to this letter, leading it to have a sort of H sound. And so the Greek letter here stands for hippos, which in ancient Greek meant a horse. And the position of the horse is where the paternal metaphor was to be located, but now where the phobic object functions in its place. All this is brought in relation to the mother, and as such mirrors the first formula. The left side, representing what Hans cannot master, is then made roughly equivalent to the devouring mother, represented by lowercase m who threatens the real penis, symbolized by capital Pi. Now notice that the castrating or devouring mother is in the place of what was the castration complex, and the real penis is in the place of the signification. The phobic object then is an attempt to deal with the anxiety of a real threat using an imaginary object that also functions as a signifier for organizing the other signifier elements in Hans's mythological creations. 
it is an imperfect substitute for the father, but one that sort of works, at least temporarily, and perhaps represents a necessary developmental milestone in the child's psychic development. And to be clear, I don't think Lacan sees the phobia as something fully negative, but rather sees it as a kind of provisional solution to an an anxiety-laced traumatic situation that helps to introduce a symbolic element that would otherwise go missing. And without it, it might be the case that we would have been dealing with a case of psychosis instead of phobia. This fourth formula presented here represents a kind of solution, I believe, or at least it seems, Lacan is claiming. On the left side, we have lowercase p standing for the imaginary father, which Hans comes to identify as in his mythological paternity in producing imaginary children. It will be through the imaginary identification that will bring him in relation to the mother, capital M. But the reason why it's a resolution is because there is then a necessary third element introduced, that being Hans's paternal grandmother, represented by M prime. And since the P is the imaginary father, it can stand in for either Hans or his own father. Hans conceives of himself as the father who will marry his mother, while conceiving of his father as the one who will marry his own mother, Hans's paternal grandmother. And somehow this reestablishes a kind of equilibrium that allows for the phobic object to dissipate. Finally, the situation is made roughly equivalent to the right side of the formula. We can see in that part a familiar structure, but with notably different terms taking each position. So here we find his little sister, Hannah, over the maternal imaginary phallus, all of which is brought into relation to the real penis. Now, admittedly, this part remains somewhat unclear to me. What I think it's saying is that little Hannah will come to override the phallic mother and to castrate her. Hans will make use of this little sister as a kind of eagle ideal, and through whom he will be able to be in a relationship of mastery with his other imaginal mythological creations, all of which is brought to bear on the mother's real phallus, which does not and never existed, but can now be accepted without the imaginary phallus veiling this lack. Again, I won't pretend that I know fully what's going on here in this last formula. But what I think is of most importance is that the formula deals with the two sources of anxiety that led to the emergence of the phobic object, separation and being devoured. Hans managed to maintain a certain relationship with the mother through his identification with the imaginary father, which no doubt is an uncommon outcome for the Oedipus complex, but can be done without fear of being devoured because, as demonstrated on the right-hand side, an imaginary substitute child can be offered up instead. Little Hana, who is able to both satisfy the mother and function as a master over the mother's imaginary phallus, while allowing this to bear on the mother's real penis through an acceptance of her privation. Regarding this resolution, Lacan states, the path Hans will have taken through the Oedipus complex in order to arrive at this is an atypical path linked to the father's shortcoming. And I think the point is that there are different kinds of equilibriums that can be satisfactorily established without it being overly problematic, in a sense sort of decentering the normalizing tendency of the Oedipus complex. If you found this video helpful and it's within your means, please consider making a super thank you tip. You can find the super thank you button below this video. If you wish to be an ongoing supporter of this channel, you can do so on Patreon where I offer video transcripts and unedited materials. The link is below. I want to thank the following for already supporting this channel on Patreon. You can also support this channel by liking and sharing this video and subscribing to my channel. So I'll see you soon for Seminar 5. As always, thank you for watching. And until next time, be well.